Hello guys, welcome to Case Closure for a fresh new perspective. Things you've never thought about, things you never will, and things you wish you never did. There was a journey we were on, a journey I absolutely love. One in which we take a deeper look at unique films and series from Korea, Japan, and hopefully even the wider world as the channel goes on. Not the films that have been talked about at infinitum, but something unique, classic, and a little obscure. While searching, I remembered a film I watched quite some time ago that fits within the spectrum we are looking for, and I cannot wait to tell you about it. But I have to start this essay by saying this is going to be a strange one, my friends. There are certain moments I cannot talk about or show you, and others that will be rather difficult to. But this is a film that is truly worth the effort. So I invite you to a rather long, slightly erratic discussion of the film. I don't promise to make total sense in the end, but I hope it is still enjoyable. Don't forget to subscribe because I'm moving earth and water to make these videos at the moment. All the same, thank you for watching. Kamako desu. The Handmaiden is a film by director Park Chan-wook, who is a contemporary of Bong Joon-ho. Bong Joon-ho, of course, the much-deserved Oscar winner for Parasite. Bong Joon-ho! One of the most brilliant films ever made that tackled our view of society with so much genius subtlety. But there is one director that brought attention to Korean films before Bong Joon-ho, and that is Park Chang-wo with his classic Old Boy, a film that shows how one can transcend the limits of the human spirit for revenge and survival. With this, Park opened Korean films to the world and made us pay attention to more unique forms of storytelling. Very few people can watch these films and come out on their side and change. As a director, I feel he leans more into the harshest reality of a world in which you cannot trust or be trusted. Unlike Bong, he rarely uses humor, instead choosing to make it more psychological, somewhat asking the question that we will never know what to trust until we die. So to begin, let me tell you about the film, especially the characters, so as to help you follow along with the essay. The Handmaiden is a historical psychological thriller focusing on a woman named Su Ki, who is brought on to be the maid of a wealthy heiress named Hideko. But it's not as innocent as it would appear. She is actually a thief working with Count Fujiwara on a much larger plan to steal all of the heiress's wealth. It is a plan that involves Fujiwara seducing, then marrying Hideko only to later cast her into an insane asylum and run off with all her money, with Suki getting a cut of that. For a while, it seems just this, and as you watch, you'd be tempted to turn away because you feel sorry for the heiress, while thinking you can predict the whole movie. <laughs> But the film offers a rather intriguing twist. In the second arc, we discover that Hideko is just as controversial as the rest of them. She had long before orchestrated another secret plan with Fujiwara to have Suki be the one buried in the insane asylum under her own name. This, she hoped, would forever free her from the abuse and control of her uncle Kuzuki. Uncle Kuzuki. My goodness, how does one even explain this character? Well, the only way I know how, I'm going to give you everything all at once. I think that history is the perfect background for this film, simply because it brings an element to this world that can best be described as insanity. Let me be as fast as possible. Kuzuki was a translator who bribed his way into translating for high officials. He then helped Japan claim land from his own homeland Korea so he could get rights to a gold mine. He later wanted to be considered Japanese, mostly because of their power as a colonizing force of that time. I interpreted it that way because of the words he uses here, that beauty is cruel, and Japan being beautiful to him, even as colonizers, would mean that he values their power, and it may have given him some strange justification for the power he also wields so cruelly. He achieved this power by marrying the daughter of a fallen noble, and went a step further by taking on his wife's family name, Kuzuki. He built a luxurious mansion with Japanese and English architecture, and filled it with enough books and antiques to make him one of the biggest collectors of the era. As time passed, his gold mine began losing value, forcing him to sell his precious collection in order to make money. But a man so in love with his prize would never sell the original copies. Instead, with Count Fujiwara, they worked together to make these forgeries for him to sell. <laughs> he then auctions the books away after private readings, and that sentence is not as innocent as it would appear. It is at this point in the film when you sit and watch and secretly question all your life choices. The movie goes into extremes, almost to the point of making it some kind of fetish, because the readings are not of what the ordinary person would consider classic works, but the most unusual erotica. 
highly sexualized books with some disturbing images, stories, and titles. I tell you, before television, I think the genre was even more explicit. And these are the kinds of books that he makes his niece read before a room of perverted gentlemen. And that summary right there could be the entirety of the handmaiden, perverted gentlemen, a near-perfect oxymoron, was that shouldn't be so close together and yet here we are. But the story is not just about this, thankfully. It really is about finding a rare spark in life in the midst of things that give us the desire to live or the desire to die. The Handmaiden is also one of the most brilliant pieces of cinematography and directing I have seen. Quite literally far too beautiful despite its dark and perverted scenes. Director Park achieves a lot of this by masterfully giving us two angles of the same moments between the three different parts of the movie. They offer new emotions and new meanings seen in a new light that can suddenly speed up the film and shock us. The amount of characterization conveyed sucks you into the world presented, making you linger in the hallways as waiting to see more. 매일 밤 자기 전에 다시 생각나는 엑스 생각나는 얼굴이래요. 매일 밤 자기 전에 다시 생각나는 엑스죠. 사랑. 사기꾼이 사랑을 하나? 사기꾼이 사랑을 하나요? I love it when people take the time to tell a compelling story, even a controversial one. And in this case, it all begins with... The first thing you hear when you watch the film is the sound of children singing. But then, in a sharp contrast, it cuts to the image of soldiers marching during a downpour. I think that this is brilliant imagery. It highlights the destruction of innocence and freedom that occurs throughout someone's life. It brings forth the rather cruel thought that our inevitable end in order to survive in this world is to lose those fresh, curious eyes that would only see the fun to be had in everything, even in the rain. We see this in how the grown soldiers cannot even tolerate the children anymore. And in that falling rain, we also see a family overburdened with babies, once a lamp of laughter, but now a source of their worries. The film seduces you into thinking this way because of your own worldview. You pity them the moment you see them, not the babies, but the overburdened ones. Then you think little boys must become soldiers, the builders of a rigid world that takes no prisoners, and little girls the overwhelmed bearers of lost generations forced to lose their innocence much earlier and much faster. And in those few scenes, the historical period is brought to life as well as our own personal beliefs. And even with the changing gender roles of our modern world, we understand how humanity saw themselves for a long time. And it helps shed light on the message the movie is ultimately trying to share in the end. That hope isn't often from the expected source of strength and power. It reminds me of this sad scene from The Blue-Eyed Samurai, a series I really recommend, in which a woman would not be allowed to sell her crafts without the presence of a man. I make the baskets, he only sold them. Please, or I can't feed my children. You know the rules, women can't travel without a chaperone. That said, despite what most people might think, I don't see The Handmaiden as a feminist film. To me, the film is more like a peek, a hidden look into a world that's ours and yet one would rather not see. That's why the film has to seduce us. It uses a look that captures us just as it captures the characters. Like using binoculars to peer in on a scandal, hoping to know the truth of the story. It is so subtly packed with imagery that makes you think, that makes you admire it despite the rain and fog. You are seduced by the beauty, the wealth, the power, the servitude. You are even seduced by the grimy faces staring back at you, wanting to understand the strange color in their eyes, wanting to touch the brokenness. And you're also seduced by the characters as the movie slows to reveal their most intimate thoughts and their ultimate destruction. As every scene, even the glittering shades mixed with beauty and vice, carry with it a message you cannot refuse. Because beneath the seduction, the movie shows us a people willing to do anything it takes, no matter how cruel, to benefit themselves. And we as viewers shudder, wondering if we see ourselves, even if it's only for a moment. This is most evident with the maid who gives too grand a speech about the house and its luxuries, giving too much praise for the current owner, Uncle Kuzuki. A maid that we later learn is his real first wife, whom he left in order to marry an heiress. A maid who therefore shares in her husband's schemes for power and control, knowing full well the darkness her husband has wrought in the lives of this woman. She is even participating in their abuse and helping him fuel the fire that leads to a mental breakdown. <laughs> And yet, 
She takes pride in the houses, giving too grand a speech about the architecture and the luxuries, fully seduced by it all. The seduction of wealth, power, and stolen nobility, despite the two of them living a life that is not quite noble. The camera seduces us into longing with the man enthralled by a thing he cannot have. Wow, that was a bit of a tongue twister. I am trying to make this epic and probably failing miserably, but bear with me. Count Fujiwara is so emblematic of the pursuit for wealth that despite his cunning, he would miss the telltale signs of his own coming doom, just so he could have the thing he never can, even for just a moment. And in these ways, through these characters, the whole film is ultimately the seduction of life and death, desire and balance, leading us to further wonder at whose reflection is in the mirror, ours or the characters, and we ask ourselves, what is it really that drives a person? It's a fascinating thing that this character brings out, the seduction of that impossible dream. Ha Jung Woo, who plays Count Fujiwara, is mesmerizing because he finds that strange merge of two extremes that exist throughout the whole film, elegant poise and abhorrent uncouthness. And this, I believe, represents the topic money versus mother, or what most psychologists would better interpret as nature versus nurture. Yoda. Count Fujiwara has a rather fascinating story. Originally the son of a farmhand, poverty forced him to work as a tout in a brothel. And with the full amount of one month's salary, he bought himself an expensive suit, probably opting to go penniless for the rest of the month. And then again, with the next month's salary, he paid to eat at the Imperial Hotel, which must have been quite an expensive dime. When Englishmen who frequented the brothel later recognized him, they were so intrigued that he was the kind of man to spend two entire salaries on clothes and food, or as Fujiwara calls it, a proper meal. I like this reveal because it's a desire that we all secretly share. I sometimes wonder what I would do if I felt it was okay to empty out all my money and spend it on one thing. It would be so frightening, and I don't think I can do it, but the only thing I ever see myself risking everything on is a holiday, and still only in my dreams. The soldiers therefore decided to call him a count and teach him to act like it. And with this knowledge, he was able to scam and con his way into positions of influence despite barely having anything to his name. What he desires most in the world is the impossible dream. This explains the sheer insanity you take to learn about an heiress, get intimate details about her life, teach himself to draw and forge documents in order to gain favor with Uncle Kozuki, then pretend to be a noble man from a recognized city only so he can one day claim her wealth. Consider what drives a person at the end of the day. Is it our nature or our nurture? A discussion that has been ongoing for a very long time. I would say upbringing plays a crucial role, but the film won't agree with me. And I like that because I get to think on different perspectives. I look and question why these men act as selfish as they do. Just like Uncle Kuzuki's view that the only thing that seems to justify heinous harm done to another person is unchecked power and unchecked desires. So when we see these two men, born without privilege and yet being able to con their way into positions of influence and power, even though there is a part in our nature that secretly admires that, we still appreciate the nobler message in the film when the two men fittingly share the same end. It proves that absolute power is what reveals one's true nature. There is no predetermination. No one color fits all. The movie further emphasizes this distinction that despite being a thief, Suki is not as cruel as Count Fujiwara despite living a rather similar life. Even the maid is crueler, despite having a life that is much more forgiving. When Suki learns what Hideko has been forced to read, she is the one to pick up the higher moral and go on a spree of book drowning. The film has really presented to us why wealth would be of such importance to these people. We see a jewel delicately placed in her hair, showing in this way that Suki is the last true hope they have. Yet some spark lights up that makes them all change their mind. Well, after a little bribery. <laughs> This presents to us a much-needed purity when it comes to friendship and humanity. Honest love, honest rage, honest concern that is not muddied with pride, lust, or envy is possible even in the foggiest of days. And in a fascinating way, therefore, the film stops being about our darkest traits, but our most praiseworthy capabilities. That anyone, even a woman so broken by the strict and loveless upbringing she endured, enough to call herself as cold as a waterfall, can reawaken and find new meaning in life.
which comes after one of the most brilliant twists ever put to film, Suri Shyamalan. In this twist, Hideko is presented as the height of evil when we see Suki being dragged away into the insane asylum instead of what we've been expecting for the entire half of the movie. We accept this new dynamic to a woman we have all along pitied and seen as helpless, bound to a cruel fate, and yet in time we are drawn back to her side. And we stop seeing her as a spoiled rich lady that's not given to the cares of the world, but we see one that's truly troubled by them. I love these scenes because our expectations of how people should act are utterly shattered. This then brings in the question of at what point does someone truly give in to evil or give in to good? We can say that we are capable of the same natures, desire for wealth, for romances in all of us. So we do understand the reason why these men quiver at the smarty stories and the indecency of it all. And yet we also see the damage it leaves behind and we sympathize. Which is why instead of nature versus nurture, I think of it more as money versus mother. Mother here representing unconditional love and our humanity towards one another. I was inspired to think this way by the first half of the film when we learned that these babies are all abandoned at birth. The film is set in the 1930s, Japanese occupied Korea, when tradition and modernity were clashing against each other. And that helps us understand why this is even possible. The traditional nobility of these men is replaced by the modern excitement of the extreme. The colonization, the shifts in lifestyle, and the expected resultant poverty would make many lose the sight of mother for the comfort of money, falling into a world where they feel no shame in selling babies without love or favor to a future that may not be as certain as they hope. But even such people are capable of love. It is here that Suki sees a rather touching thing that seemed to come out of nowhere. If she had milk, she would circle all these rejected babies, showing that her humanity is not fully lost. And when she meets a lonely lady brought up without the love of a mother, she becomes the voice that worries after her. Money versus mother is all about what we find ourselves capable of doing when the question of survival is forced upon us. And it is this individual choice that determines who is mother and who is monster. Because there are conmen and thieves in all places, from the lustrous halls of palaces to the grimy corridors of hidden slums, just as nobles and heroes can come from anywhere. And yet we cannot deny that the only thing of lasting value to the human soul is mother, love, and the humanity that comes from any act of kindness. Deep down, our nature isn't to be cruel, but one in which we long for the best in each other and for each other. We want to be in communities that thrive for the better. And given the opportunity, if money wasn't such a powerful negative influence, we would be surprised at the lengths we would go to in order to save one another. We're reminded that even in the shadows, there can be a crack of brightness. And that said, there are two other things that captivate us that are much, much harder to split apart. There are moments in this movie that make you feel insane as you watch it. What I mean is that the most beautiful scenes of cinematography, of directing, of nature, are often followed by some of the most explicit scenes. So explicit, actually, that you're not so sure if you should be aroused or concerned. It got me thinking about how we view these two dimensions. When we share stories that are extreme, is it art or is it a fetish? The fetish in this case being an over-exaggeration of the human experience and our desires, while art is a more clever and sometimes subtle exploration of humanity, culture and creativity. So why talk about these two things together? They couldn't be further apart from each other, right? Well, because I believe the director wants to openly show our most animalistic characteristics and our most exemplary ones so that we get to ask ourselves what most captures us, the art or our fetish. I'll begin by saying that I don't think that all fetishes are bad. If you know one that is good, you could tell me about it in the comments. Of course, don't go into any details. <laughs> That'd be too scary for YouTube. But I think there is some interesting way in which the film is trying to make us look at this topic. First, by having the romance be between two women which was unusual for the time period, and also because it is a kind of fetish. In this film, it's not the man that saves the day, which would have been expected, like Shrek braving a dragon to free Fiona. Just like Hideko, a great beauty locked away in her elegant tower and having father and mother figures steeped in cruelty. This would be the perfect grounds upon which to introduce the male hero, have him drive up in a luxurious car and save the heroine. 
When you think about it in terms of presenting the unorthodox, this is the perfect grounds upon which to ask the question of art versus fetish. Because it is this unusual romance for its time that topples the greater sexual fetish of the film, with Uncle Kuzuki cradling his dirty little books like Croya Jewels. So, there is a clear vice and a clear virtue, a distinction that a fetish is not art and art should not be a fetish. But we often blur the lines in storytelling so much so that we don't see the difference of which is what. This is so perfectly presented by the fact that the one person who points out the vices directly is a stammerer. Because the film does present a clear difference by showing that art is universal, easily accepted by everyone and nearly anyone who views it, even if we draw up different interpretations. And in its purest form, fetish is only of value to the person who holds it. Consider this scene in which we learn that Fujiwara has been working with Soki all along. Count Fujiwara presents Uncle Huzuki as a wooden sculpture, not just any ordinary wooden sculpture, but one that was possibly made during a period in time when rich nobles used them to hide their valuables. In that case, you'd only know if one such carving had money inside it by opening it or breaking it. This representation of Huzuki can refer to his fetish. In many ways, it may or may not offer any value. And the film shows us that in the end, it offered no value to many people, including Uncle Huzuki himself. <laughs> so I admit that this is a hard topic to talk about and has no clear answer. But if we could bring up another scene, maybe it would help. This would be the image of the snake. Heavy! Heavy! <laughs> that sits between two spaces, between knowledge and innocence in a way. This knowledge here being represented by the library as a space that most people are not allowed to go into. It even has a metal gate that closes shut. In another way, the snake also represents how certain desires can take a hold of us. This is to say, whether the snake is poisonous to you or not depends entirely on which side of the snake you linger. This is further explored in the stories told to the men. In one of the most dramatic scenes, we see the portrayal of a fetish that results in death. <laughs> Later on, in the moment of this death, fetish is represented by a basement, a windowless room in which we might just lose our ability to breathe. There has been a subtle theme throughout the movie that can go unnoticed. In fact, I only noticed it after a second viewing. And that is the breath, things that cling to us until we die. In many ways, our breath is used to represent the current path we are on of either the scented flowers and perfumes, or the open air, or even the poisoned smoke. It all starts with the scene where Suku sings about what scent it is that she is discovered, to Hideko catching her breath after a long read in a troubled space, to breathing in the fragrance of a new life to the clear white smoke Fujiwara inhales on a bright sunny day, unaware of the freedom that he has in that moment, to the blue poison of mercury he breathes in at the end that kills both men. Uncle Kuzuki calls it his smoke, and before dying suddenly in the haze, he actually considers it beautiful. This smoke therefore marks the manner of his life that lacked warmth or even a proper legacy to leave behind. And as the film ends, we hear the final press of this broken desire giving way to the freedom of open air. It poses the question to us, what kind of life are you living until you die? But with the right breath, you can find that on the open seas, even soldiers can be seen at ease. There is a rather sad yet powerful way in which the film tries to remind us of our breath. And it's all about this tree. The most beautiful thing in the entire movie and yet one that is tainted with death and in a sad way the impact of this is always looming over Hideko no. but when the smoke wafts away when there's a chance for clear air it goes back to that beautiful symbol of a wonderful life and I sort of like that because life can be tainted with horrible fog and horrible smoke but once you clear out the air be willing to allow hope to touch you, and even freedom from negative thoughts. You'll be surprised at the beauty that still lingers. A breath of value that will give our lives true meaning until we die. <laughs> Do 
The Handmaiden is a rather beautiful movie despite its strange insanity. It is so well directed and filmed that it seems to create a culture all its own. The slow pace of certain scenes only enhances the richness of the characters. The subtle music, the horrifying moments and even the atmosphere combine to make this a rather remarkable piece of art with one of the most bizarre endings I have ever seen put to film. I even hesitate to show you the little that I am showing you. This is definitely one of the most unique viewing experiences I have ever had. It is one of those movies that I will find myself watching again in future, not for the naughty bits mind you, but just to admire the beauty of it and hope that it may also ignite in me something creative. So I highly recommend you to watch it even though I pretty much spoiled it to some smithereens. It is a rather unique piece of media. Thank you guys so much for watching. This video took some commitment since The Handmaiden is an old film and probably not on anyone's radar at the moment. But I really wanted to explore its hidden spaces. No pun intended. I also want to venture again into the journey we were on with Korean and Japanese films. I feel like there is so much more amazing stories out there hidden behind different languages and different periods of time. So come along with me and who knows what we'll discover next. Please do subscribe, hit the notification, like, share, tell me your deepest thoughts on what the movie revealed to you in the comments and I promise you I'll keep improving as the days go by because this is probably the weirdest video on my channel. But thanks so much again for watching, I hope you're having a great week and I will see you next time.